There we go. Let me change our view and let's get into the good stuff. All right, welcome everybody via Zoom and Facebook. I'm Megan Marshall. I'm the director of the QC High Living Writers Series. And tonight I'm so excited to welcome our featured guest who is both a stellar writer and scholar. And as I was saying earlier, we were so happy to have her read for us in person back in 2016, but of course, equally as grateful and excited to have her joining us all the way virtually from North Carolina, staying up very late to be with us. So we're, we're appreciative of you for that. Um, but before I introduce her, I do wanna thank those who have helped to make this event possible. And that of course includes Marco Tumlin, my fabulous co-host, and our other friends uh, from Love Library, Donnie Luca Hall, Laurel Bliss, and Rebecca Williamson. I'd also like to thank the Department of English and Comparative Literature for their continued support of the series. I know this is not our first Zoom rodeo, but of course, just a quick reminder, please keep your mics muted. Uh, know this event is being recorded and live streamed. If you'd like to check out the recording at any point after the event, please visit us and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. In addition to our uh, recorded readings, we have a lot of other great content on there, responses from students enrolled in the class. So tons and tons of good stuff to take up all of your time. Um, and uh, once the presentation has finished, we will have a Q&A session. So I should get some questions for Sayantani, then hold on them, onto them, and we'll get to them in just a minute. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome our featured author. Born in Calcutta and raised in New Delhi, Sayantani Dasgupta is an assistant professor of creative writing at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. She has also taught creative writing in India, Italy, and Mexico. She is the author of Women Who Misbehave, Fire Girl, Essays on India, America, and the In-Between, which was a finalist for the Forward Indies Awards for Creative Nonfiction, and the chapbook, The House of Nails, Memories of a New Delhi Childhood. Her writing has appeared in over 50 literary journals and magazines, including The Hindu, The Rumpus, Scroll, Economic and Political Weekly, Chicago Quarterly Review, and many others. She's been awarded a Centrum Foundation Fellowship, a Pushcart Prize Special Mention, and is also the winner of season three of Write India, judged by the novelist uh, Kavita Kane and organized by the Books Division of the Times of India. She's currently at work on a memoir. Sayan Tenney's most recent collection of short stories, Women Who Misbehave, bravely challenges the tired tropes of women characters. Instead of the stereotypical savior, mother, femme fatale, Sayantani presents us with characters who are neither hero nor villain, but somewhere in between. Real nuanced women who are given the space to be human and ignore the rules of decorum. This is a book that reminds us of the power of narrative to challenge established uh, perceptions and to champion diverse voices. Of the collection, writer Janice Perriott raves, Sayantani Dasgupta's stories are bright, beautiful shards of glass. These aren't all nice women, but they're real and honest and vulnerable. And you come away feeling for them as you would if you were to know them in real life. So please join me in welcoming Sayantani Dasgupta. Every time, every time. All right, but now I have unmuted myself. Uh, Megan, thank you so much to you and to the entire department, um, to the city of San Diego as well, because I really cherish my visit from 2016 and I so wish we were doing this in person. But again, as you said, sometime soon, hopefully in the future. Um, <clears throat> I would love to see some more folks turn on their cameras if they can. If, I'm, if I may request, if I may be so bold as to request some of you to show me your lovely faces because already Zoom is its own strange beast. But if on Zoom land I can see some of you, that would be just lovely. Thank you so much. Um, Michael Lopez, is that a dog behind you or a cat? I can't quite tell. It's- This is Nagia. Nagia likes to sit up my head over here all the time. Wonderful. I think this is the best part of <laughs> get to see all these other 
creatures, beings, people who are taking our classes and our, joining in our conversations. So Michael, thank you for making Nugget a part of this conversation this evening. All right, so um, I will begin by talking a little bit uh, how the book came together. And then uh, Megan, as per your request, I will read for a bit and then open it up for Q&A. So I wrote this book. It took me about 14 years to get all the stories together. So it's been a long time coming. I came to the US in 2006 as a student of fiction to get my MFA in creative writing in fiction because um, at that time I had not heard of anything called creative nonfiction. And the only nonfiction that was coming out in India in 2006 was either cookbooks or travel writing or memoirs by politicians who had been corrupt all their lives and were about to die and thought they needed to write books or something. It was not a good, it was not a good scene necessarily for memoirs. Uh, then I came here to the, uh, to the US and in my first semester of my MFA program, we were very much encouraged to take classes, to, to cross-pollinate as the term was, to take classes in other genres. And I took a bunch of classes with Professor Kim Barnes and uh, in creative nonfiction, and that changed my life. I could not believe that I could just write about my own life and that was going to make sense to anyone and that was going to be um, readable, interesting, whatever. So I ended up switching from fiction to nonfiction. My MFA turned out to be in creative nonfiction and I teach creative nonfiction at uh, University of North Carolina, Wilmington. But I think my love for fiction has never really gone away. And if you are writing nonfiction, the building blocks of nonfiction are still very much derived from fiction and from poetry, because obviously those offer us the foundational principles of writing. Um, some of these stories were, I think, written in response to the fact that when I was growing up in India in the 80s and 90s, a lot of the women I was seeing, particularly in cinema and on TV shows, were women who were constantly sacrificing themselves, be it for their husbands or their boyfriends or their dads or uh, brothers. I mean, really, their gardeners, gardeners' children, I don't know who all, but everybody was more important than they themselves. And that did not sit well with me because thanks to my parents, my grandparents, I have always had a very sort of solid sense of myself, of my own worth. And I'm deeply grateful to them for giving me that. And I think, and this might be controversial, but I'm just going to go, just jump ahead and risk saying this. I think selfishness is a beautiful thing. I think it's wonderful to be selfish because if you are selfish and if you are honoring your own desires and the things that you want in life, you are going to be, I think, a nicer human being to the people around you. If you can con constantly put others in your life before you, I think that resentment builds up. There cannot be selflessness forever. So at some point, it will probably start reflecting in the way you treat others in your life, in the way, um, I don't know, you go about your work, um, your professional life, so on and so forth. So I think selfishness is beautiful. I think selfishness is wonderful. I think selfishness is selfless to an extent. And women who misbehave is is that. I think all my women are selfish to an extent. And uh, that's not to say that they all fare very well because of their selfishness, but, um, but that's okay because we can't always have everything we want, but this is who they are and uh, this is what they wanted in life and so on and so forth. So that's sort of the founding principle behind uh, some of the stories of this book. And then when three or four came together, 
it started making sense and just more of the story started coming. And um, I think for a while I was also hesitating in terms of writing fiction was because when I was um, a student of creative writing um, here, the kinds of stories, um, the kinds of works we were reading, they felt very different from the kinds of stories I had grown up with. And in India, of course, I was not reading a lot of American literature when I was growing up. And English is my third language. So in my childhood, I was also reading a lot in Bengali and in Hindi, my two other languages. And these stories came from sort of, I would say a different storytelling style, a very different storytelling tradition. And when I came here as a student, the kinds of stories I was reading here seemed to have a very different style. And it took me a while to go back and find the Indian reader and the Indian writer in myself. Because I think when I was a student, uh, whatever your professors, whatever your peers think is good writing, you automatically start prioritizing that in your own head as good writing. And you perhaps forget a little bit who you are and the fact that you are in the program, you are in an MFA program because you kind of know some basics of storytelling yourself and you are passionate about storytelling. So now having been in the field of creative writing for about 15 years and having read a lot, having written a lot, having taught a lot, I know that there are as many kinds of storytelling as there are people in the world. And we need to honor different styles of storytelling. We need to read a lot. We need to honor diverse voices. We need to read from places that we don't know about. We need to read about people and read by people who don't look anything like us, who don't write anything right. So um, yeah, that's sort of all the background to how Women Who Misbehave came together. Um, I will go ahead and read a bit. Megan, is that, is that all right to move into that? Okay. So I'm going to read from the short story, Miss Josephine. And if you have the book, if you have the hard copy, then this is on page 81, if you want to follow along. And Miss Josephine may or may not have been inspired by, you know, that fairy tale, Hansel and Gretel, where there is that witch character. And Miss Josephine may or may not have been inspired by that. And Miss Josephine, um, may or may not offer more than one mystery. So let's see. When Miss Josephine died, we all cried like we had lost our mothers. But Miss Josephine looked nothing like our mothers. She was neither brown nor young. She did not wear cotton saris or nylon salwar kameezes. Miss Josephine was old and white, her face the texture of beaten leather, her hair a nest of gray. Her skin turned a vivid red in the sun as if she had been held against her wishes and someone had struck angry wells on her body. That's why our mothers said, God never intended for Miss Josephine to be in India. But we, her fan club, vehemently disagreed because without Miss Josephine, our childhood wouldn't have tasted very good. It would have been as unremarkable as that of kids in neighborhoods that didn't have an old white lady baker of their own. It was Miss Josephine's black forest cake that we ate on our birthdays, the leftovers of her pastries that we nibbled on when our mothers hosted kitty parties and her rum cakes and fruit pies that marked our Christmases and New Year's. Without Miss Josephine, how would we have ever learned to appreciate an apple strudel or its flaky crust. Her foods nourished us as much as our mother's milk. But unlike our mothers, Miss Josephine rarely smiled and never once asked about our well being. What she lacked in motherly love, she more than made up with her creations rich, gooey, and saturated with sugar. No one quite knew when Miss Josephine had first moved into the corner house. 
She was already there when our mothers arrived, one after the other, as blushing brides, eager and excited to start this new chapter of their lives. Of course, the corner house wasn't really a house. It had been built to function as an annex, but the landlord had rented it out to make some extra money on the side. From the outside, it was unimpressive to say the least. It was blotchy and gray, the color of spit. It was a box shaped, it was box shaped with plain brown windows on all four sides. Despite multiple attempts and our best efforts, we could never see through the windows. Miss Josephine kept them covered with heavy curtains. And if she ever washed and changed them, she surely did so in the middle of the night with the lights turned off. Whenever any of her customers found out where she lived, they always seemed shocked that the maker of such divine creations, an artist in her own right, could exist day after day in something so utterly devoid of color and character. No one ever saw the inside of her house because in all the years she lived on our street, Miss Josephine never invited anyone. When we asked our mothers why, they came up with a variety of explanations, some more creative than others. Perhaps Miss Josephine kept her secret recipes inside a locked cabinet that she didn't want, the, didn't want to show the world. Perhaps she was embarrassed that brown people lived in bigger homes than hers. Perhaps she liked the peace and quiet for prayer and meditation purposes. Or maybe because one of her family members was a notorious serial killer and she had his life-size poster on a wall. Their answers never satisfied us. And so Miss Josephine's house remained a mystery. The only evidence of her artistry lay in the neatly trimmed row of grass surrounding the annex. She kept it clean and perfect, as if in readiness of a military grade inspection. One summer, we came up with an innovative plan to peek inside her home. As soon as Miss Josephine returned from the bakery, we decided to march over with a big bowl of turmeric paste that we told her was from our mothers so that she could put it on her skin and soothe herself. We knocked loudly on her door and waited. She opened it a crack and poked her head out, her beady blue eyes watchful, as if for monsters, her sparse eyebrows pinched and her thick chin quivering slightly. We breathed in the mixed smells coming from within, washing soap, cabbage, vanilla, but could never tell if she was genuinely scared or hamming it up for our benefit. Her frightened face only made us uncomfortable. And after a week of attempts, we gave up. Needless to say, not once did she thank us for the turmeric paste, nor did she invite us in. Miss Josephine dressed the same every day. She wore large full sleeved blouses in black or gray and thick skirts that came down to her calves. She didn't own any jewelry except for a slim silver dial watch with a black strap which may have fit her once, but was now clamped on her left wrist like the jaws of a shark. Her sagging skin, speckled with red and brown freckles, stretched uncomfortably over her hands and face as if they couldn't contain her weight anymore. Her ankles were as fat as trees, and we joked that she must have to sleep with her shoes on, the sturdy black leather ones so tight that we were sure she could not pry them off and yet their buckles shone as if she polished them every night. Our mothers scolded us whenever they caught us giggling over Miss Josephine. They told us to leave her alone because clearly that's what the old lady wanted. Plus she never troubled anyone, but often our mothers too succumbed to the same temptation. And we would hear them chuckling over how little Miss Josephine had changed since the time each of them had first arrived in the neighborhood. She must have been born old, was everyone's conclusion. Sometimes our mothers would worry about Miss Josephine too. She's getting on in her years, they would say, wondered if she has any family anywhere. And then they would add, she really should be a little more forthright and tell us about herself. Who will run around if something happens? hospital, doctors, medicines, who will shoulder that responsibility? Of course, we will help. We are good, decent people here, but still family is family. Were our mothers genuinely concerned 
or did they know how to make excuses in advance? In spite of God knows how many decades in this country, Miss Josephine only spoke English. She didn't sound English though. We knew what English English was like. We had watched enough episodes of Yes, Prime Minister and Mind Your Language. But every time we asked her where she was from, Miss Josephine shooed us away. Deepthi, taller and often smarter than the rest of us, and our self-proclaimed leader, because she was two whole years older, insisted that Miss Josephine sounded like she could be from Austria. We had no choice but to take her word, because thanks to her diplomat father, Dipti had spent three months in Austria and now considered herself the last word on all things European. The year Miss Josephine retired from the bakery, an American ice cream shop opened across the street. Miss Josephine continued to sell some of her specialties from home, provided we remembered to put in a request the night before. More often than not, we forgot, which was just as well. By then we were almost 12 and desserts stopped mattering as much. Or they did, but we knew how to suppress our greed than to give in like gluttons. The ice cream shop offered a whole new world filled with unusual flavors and exciting infinite possibilities. But the biggest temptation it offered was the high school boys from Don Bosco who stopped there every evening after soccer practice. We watched them from the corners of our eyes. Sweaty from practice, they smelled of dirt, dust, grass, and something else. They took up the entire corner table, pulling in chairs noisily as if they owned the place. They looked at us appraisingly and their gaze heated something underneath our skin. Sometimes they smiled at us, though to them we were probably nothing more than little girls. But we didn't feel like little girls. So we watched them, those toned arms, the sweat pearling against their skin, the way they licked their mouths and wiped their chins. Miss Josephine died the year most of us turned 13. It was her landlord who discovered her. He had stopped by, puzzled that she was two days late in paying her rent. Apparently that had never happened in the 29 years she had been his tenant. When he broke open the door, he found her in bed. The doctor declared that she had died in her sleep, heart failure, mostly painless. Like she had been throughout her life in death too, Miss Josephine was quiet and un unobtrusive. She didn't scream or shout or in any way inconvenience the people who lived around her. We were at school when it happened, probably planning yet another trip to the ice cream shop in the evening to tease both our taste buds and our eyes. We heard it in the afternoon when the school bus dropped us home and our mothers rushed to us with the news. By then, the landlord's servants had removed her body. With the doors and windows wide open, her house resembled a demolished cake. Its innards spilled out for everyone to witness its humiliation. When the landlord saw us approaching, he gave us a wan smile and said we were free to pick up anything we thought had sentimental value before he sent in the servants to clean. He warned us to not be disappointed though. As far as he could tell, Miss Josephine owned nothing of value. His permission seemed so outrageous and unbelievable that for a few moments, we forgot Miss Josephine was dead. We ran all the way, pushing and shoving each other to be the first to enter this Aladdin's cave that had so far been denied to us. Our mothers followed right behind, walking as quickly as the dignity would allow. We came to an abrupt stop at the door, as if any moment now, <clears throat> Miss Josephine would emerge and shoo us away. But that didn't happen. When we remembered our reason for being there, fresh tears pricked our eyes. We entered a room lit resentfully by the last rays of a setting sun. It revealed a plain cement floor and patchy gray walls in need of repair. The outlines against the windows clearly showed where the thick, heavy curtains had once been. In spite of the open windows and sunshine, the house smelled faintly of cabbage and vanilla. Dipti's mother coughed loudly 
and clamped the ends of her pallu to her nose as if she would be the next one to drop dead if she wasn't too careful. Only her eyes were visible above her sari and she looked like an overgrown owl, round-eyed and watchful. The drawing room led directly into the kitchen and onto the bedroom and bathroom on the left. We trooped into the kitchen, which had an old but functional gas stove, nothing even remotely fancy. The shelves stacked to the walls contained an assortment of overused pots, baking pans, measuring cups and spoons. Someone reminded Dipti of, of how she had once claimed that Miss Josephine had offered to teach her how to make the most perfect apple strudels. We laughed as Deepthi's cheeks colored at the memory of a tall tale. After all, we didn't get too many opportunities to prove she wasn't that much better than us. Really, how could she have thought we would believe her fantastic story? A few books on baking were propped against the kitchen counter and our mothers advanced towards them like a mob. We left them there and entered the bedroom, which was as sparse as the rest of the house. It too had a distinct smell, a combination of detergent and old clothes. The single bed had already been stripped bare of sheets and now held two worn pillows and a thin mattress stained yellow with age. A modest sized closet held Miss Josephine's entire array of eight full sleeved cotton dresses and skirts and three bulky sweaters in black, brown and navy. At the sight of our familiar dresses, a few in our group started sobbing. We huddled around to comfort them and didn't notice when Divti moved past us towards the bookshelf beside Miss Josephine's bed. What's this? She cried. We ran to her, our gaze following the direction of her finger. All five shelves were filled with identical notebooks, the kinds we used in school, inexpensive and with ruled pages inside. Miss Josephine had numbered them all. There were 41 of them, their ears jotted and taped to the spines. Greedily, Deepthi pulled down the diary marked one. A hush descended into the room as we crowded around her. She opened the first page. We read the date, 1st January, 1948, and recognized the neat spindly letters. They were Miss Josephine's all right. We had seen her write down orders at the bakery and at home. We had read her many receipts. The page in the notebook, however, contained four words repeated over and over. At least we assumed there were four words. We recognized the letters and sounded them out, but strung like that, they made no sense. Nothing was capitalized or punctuated, just a string of letters repeated again and again. ICH space W U S S T E space N I C H T space H E R S C H E L. Dipti turned the page. It was the same four words again unpronounceable, unfathomable. The notebook switched hands, but irrespective of who tried and how many times, the letters didn't make any sense. Dipti looked stumped too, which was its own reward in some ways. Impatiently and with arms outstretched like we were meeting long lost relatives, we pulled down the remaining diaries, all 41 of them. We propped against chairs, spread ourselves on the floor, each of us grabbing a few and checking them meticulously. The first page, then the last, and then to make sure opening it randomly in the middle and zipping through a few more. It didn't matter what year we picked or which diary. They were exactly the same. We repeated it like a chant until we had memorized the letters. Our mothers took turns too, but one by one, they failed as well. We hoped our fathers would fare better. I'll stop here. Well, thank you so much. And so I know one of the things we, we lack in these Zoom meetings, right, is the actual sound of the applause. So as per usual, I'm gonna welcome folks to unmute themselves and give you a real applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cyanteni. That was a, a great choice. One of my favorites from the collection to read for us this evening. 
Um, but now I want to open it up to some questions from our attendees. So if you have a question, yeah, if you want to use the little hand raise function, or certainly you are welcome to put um, your question into the chat and we'll get to as many as we can with the time that we have allotted. Um, so let's start with uh, with Rachel, I think is the first I see with a hand. Hi. Hi Thank you so much for reading. I really enjoyed your collection. Um, my uh, question was about the floral illustrations that um, are above the chapters. Um, in class, we kind of um, thought they like intertwined or maybe were like through lines for the collection. But I'm curious to know what the different types of flowers are and if they have any like symbolic resonance to the chapters that they precede. Rachel, thank you for your kind words and for that lovely observation. I am deeply afraid I'm going to disappoint you because I had nothing to do with the flowers or with the, you know, the beautiful imagery um, or the cover. Uh, none of those are to my credit. I'm so sorry. But uh, my editor contacted me when the book was sort of, you know, in the final stages. And she said, we are trying this new thing with your book. And um, we are going to, you know, I'm just going to prop this up so that folks who might not have the book in front of them can see. But every story begins with, this, with some or the other lovely flower design. And she said, we have not really done this for any other book, but we are going to try this for yours and, um, and, just, and just see. So I thought it was such a lovely idea. And this entire book happened you know, completely online. Like I was not in India when this book was put together. I was not in India for any of the conversations. Everything was via Zoom or WhatsApp or email. So it felt like a very surreal experience to not have any in-person meeting at all. And I myself have not seen a book of short stories where each story is accompanied by its own specific drawing. So this was such a, such a treat. And I will convey your observation to my editorial team. I think they would enjoy that very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel, for that question. I think we, we had a fun time in class debating about what the flowers could represent. And I think that's just kind of a testament that once the book got, goes out into the world, it kind of takes on its own life, right? So it can be interpreted in different ways. And so even though it, it. it yeah, it was just part uh, a choice on the part of the editor, we, we had fun discussing it in class. All right, I think uh, Marib has a question. Apologies if I mispronounced that. Please correct me. It's okay, it's Marib. Marib, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question. I'm not very, I'm not familiar with the book at all, but um, as you're reading the story, I noticed that most of the pronouns were like our and written from like a we kind of perspective. And I was wondering who the narrator was. Yeah, thank so, you for that question. There no... uh, so each, each of the stories, I hope, um, sounds different because the voice is different, the point, the perspective is different. So this one is from a first person plural, which is the we. So it's like a collective voice. And the narrator of this story, it's actually a group of girls, a group of little girls who are telling us the story. And by the time the story ends, they, they, they become adults and they are sort of looking at their childhood from a slightly different lens. But the part that I read to you is very much from the point of view of all of them as, you know, starting off as perhaps seven or eight and then moving on to about 12 or 13. Um, and it's how the stories came in my head. And of course, this will sound strange to anyone who is not a writer, but um, when on a daily basis people show up inside my head, uh, I have to ignore a lot of them because there is so much of else to be done. You know, there are, I teach, so I have to tend to my students, I have to prepare lectures, I have to be an adult and do things like laundry and cook food and those sorts of things that come in the way. But uh, there are some characters who just won't listen and, you know, 
that, oh, I'm busy and they are not going to go away. They'll just wait in the corner until, until I have done them some justice. So these girls were like that. They were like, we're not leaving, do what you will. So then the only thing that, that was left to do was write them down. And this is how, this was the, uh, it was a very strong voice that showed up. And um, that's why they got written this way. And each of the stories came like that. And of course, you know, you are a reader, so you understand exactly what I'm saying. But to anyone who is not of this particular world of reading and writing, it must be like, this is a very strange person who has people show up in her head and who are like pulling up chairs and sitting down and not leaving. So it sounds all kinds of messed up, but of course to writers, this is, this is every day. So thank you for that question. Thank you for answering. That is a very unique perspective. I have never read a, I don't think I've ever read a story that was written first person, plural. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great question. Um, let's see, I think next up uh, was Arnisha. Our little watch party. <laughs> Mini watch party today. Um, I, I love the book so much. I resonated with, with so much of it. Um, I think it was great. My favorite personal story was uh, The Waitress. But um, my question is, and, and it's not quite worded all the way yet, but I feel like in class we kind of had this pretty sizable debate or conversation around like male readership and like their takeaway from the book or, or interactions with the book. Um, do you think like when you wrote this, did it matter to you like who was reading the book and, and how they interacted with the book or did you have an expectation of how male readers would interact with this uh, text? That's such a great question, thank you. So I also love the watch party, by the way. I have to give you a shout out for that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> wonderful. Um, I wrote this book for the 15-year-old me. That was my primary audience. 15-year-old me needed a lot of role models who were women, who were women that were not necessarily part of the exact specific social, economic, political world to which I belonged or to which my parents belonged and therefore I belong to it. 15 year old me would have really benefited from interacting with women from a diverse sort of um, array of life experiences. And when I was writing this book, I did not think at all about readers anywhere actually. I mean, maybe that sounds horrible and cruel, but I had to write this for 15 year old me who would have, I feel felt better after reading such a book because I, I mentioned earlier that I was really lacking in characters who were standing up for themselves in television and cinema when I was 15. And so something like that, something like this book would have been helpful. And as far as male readers, I did not think that, uh, I did not think about them or the fact that they wouldn't read the book or they wouldn't like the book, simply because women historically read books written by both women and men. And we don't stop to question typically, um, oh, I should not be reading this book because it's been written by a man. I mean, why not? Because men comprise 50% of humanity's experiences. So we are supposed to read about how they go about lives, how they go about figuring things out. And I have the same expectation from men that they would be just as curious that, oh, if I don't read female authors, I'm denying myself 50% of humanity right there. And um, I should be a you know, just, just the act of being human means that I need to read things written by people who are not me so that I can understand myself also in a, in a, in a more rounded sort of a way. So Anisha, I was not thinking about readers outside of that. And um, I think, yeah, I think that's all I have to say because in, you know, when I wrote my first book, Fire Girl, which is a collection of essays on India and America, and the experience of sort of, uh, even though it's been 15 years of, for me for, of living in the US, 50% of me still very much lives in India. 
and it is so homesick all the time. And right now, because of the pandemic, I have not been able to go home in the last um, it's almost two and a half, three years. And it's a constant, it's a constant ache because 50% of me is very much in India. But then when I visit India, 50% of me now lives in the US. So I'm equally homesick for the US. When I was writing that first book, it was very important to me that the book made sense to Indian, American, as well as pretty much any reader who is cosmopolitan and lives pretty much anywhere in the world. I did not want my Indian readers to feel disrespected while reading Fire Girl, because a lot of times when writers from South Asia, India, Pakistan, et cetera, write in the US, sitting in the US, they over explain their background. So for anyone who is off their background and reading their work, it seems like they are over explaining the most basic things that you would just know if you were Indian. I do not want any of my Indian readers to feel disrespected. At the same time, I did not want any of my American readers to feel that, oh, this book is not for me. This is too strange. This is too obscure. This is too much of India and it does not invite me in. With this book, I gave myself all the freedom in the world because I was just writing for 15 year old me. So that's my perhaps very long answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you. All right, yes, great question. And I appreciate your, your generous answer. That was also kind of part of our conversation that we had in class. And it kind of, I mean, it just reminded me of one thing that you started out saying, um, Sayanteni, about you know, reading outside of your personal experience and the importance of that really. And I think of books, you know, literature as sort of empathy generators. And I think we don't really, you know, we, we don't have the possibility to, to experience outside of our own kind of myopic bubble sometimes, unless we choose to take on those experiences. And I think, you know, literature is a great way to do that and to build empathy and to understand and see through the eyes of someone who is not us and not ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Um, I was kind of curious. So, um, you know, as a poet, I'm always thinking about sequencing when I'm putting together a collection of my work. So I was wondering if maybe you could speak on how you chose to sequence the, the stories in the collection. You know, did you give a lot of thought to what came first, what came last? What if you could take us through that process? Yeah. So, um, the way I submitted the collection to them versus how it how they shaped it is very different. But uh, my only request was that they should, if they can, they should start the collection with the party. And they kept that request. And I also wanted the book to end with the short story Knots. Uh, Knots is very dear to me because it is sort of very loosely inspired by the story of my grandparents. And my paternal grandmother, uh, got pregnant and with my father and um, she was not really in a position to sort of be happy about this uh, this conceiving and I remember I, this memory is very clear to me um, I was about 14 or so when she told me this entire story and she started it off by saying your father was an unwanted child and she said that sentence to me in English, which is not something we used at home because we always spoke in Bengali, that being our first language. But when she said that sentence, I, I felt like blood drained from my entire body. I froze because of course, without the existence of my father, there is no existence of me. So I think it was just maybe a, a very a selfish 14 year old reaction like, what, grandma, how can you say something like that? But of course, forgetting that grandma was not always grandma. Grandma was a 22 year old at some point. Grandma had perhaps different desires and hopes. And she was a terrific, my grandma is still around. She was a terrific mother. She is a terrific mother. She uh, was a fabulous grandmother um, and still is. But of course, we are so used to seeing the adults in our lives when we are young, when we are teenagers, and younger that, oh, you must have been a grandma from the moment you were born, or you must have been a mom from the moment you were born. But that's not true. They had so many lives. They had so many experiences before we came along and probably mucked it up for them. 
So uh, it was therefore my request if they could keep knots at the end because I wanted it to feel like I was honoring my grandparents. And the first story, the party, which is very loosely inspired by a very awkward party I attended when I first started working. And it was all sorts of uncomfortable. Um, and funnily enough, there are so many people who have written to me about how much the party resonated with them because they have all been in awkward social situations where all they want to do is go back home, but because of some or other force or circumstance, they cannot leave that gathering. Um, so I wanted this, the collection to start with something, I think that uncomfortable. And uh, there are two stories which work like in a sequence. One is Shaji and Satnam and the sequel, If Only Somewhere. And those had to be together. But otherwise, um, it was the editors who sort of arranged how they felt the collection would work. So um, you can say this, the end result is a little bit of their work and my work put together and going back and forth on that. Great, thank you. Well, I love, I mean, starting with the party because it's such a, it definitely sets the tone and texture for the collection, I think. Um, and just that, that sense of like social discomfort, I think is rather universal. So that it's, it's, it's definitely a connective tissue for the reader and those characters in the story. Thanks. Uh, okay, uh, Tyler has a question. Hi, uh, thank Hi. you so much for coming here and reading for us. Um, so real quick, kind of when we're talking about like the form of like a collection of short stories, um, I was just kind of wondering like what, what kind of made you want to write short stories instead of, of say like a, a novel or something longer? Um, what affordances does the genre enable you as an author? And have you ever imagined yourself maybe writing something longer in the future? Yeah, Tyler, thank you for that question. So I have one novel complete that's sitting in a desk drawer that has not yet seen um, the affectionate gaze of a publisher. And I might have to go back to it at some point and find a way to tweak it, etc. I think part of why short stories really appeal to me is the same reason why I really like writing essays. You can just write this one thing and be done, right? So in our world where there are so many distractions, it's just, it's hard to focus on this gigantic narrative for me. And I am also, I can also be very impatient. My husband will say, I am very impatient. I'm just like, trying to soften it and make myself seem like a cooler person in front of you all. So I'm just going to say that I think I am an impatient person. Um, so short stories therefore seem manageable because you are working with a smaller cast of characters and a novel just seems daunting by comparison because you are working with, of course, so many people and perhaps you know too many things that are happening, so on and so forth. I am at work on another novel these days and it's taking sort of baby steps in that direction. Um, so I think it's mostly the length and I feel that once I've written something, I'm just so eager to move on to the next thing. And a novel seems like daunting because you have to spend so much time with those same people and what if you get bored in the middle of it? You can't kill all of them. You'll have to keep some of them alive. Too much, too much pressure. So short story seems more manageable. But Tyler, if I finish the novel, I'll let you know because it will be, it would, it would be like climbing a whole mountain. So I will be very proud of myself if I do that successfully. Thank you. Great. Well, I, I kind of feel like if you're a writer or like to be a writer, you know, you need a few things. One of those maybe is like the characters walking around in your head. Um, and another is some sort of manuscript that's collecting dust that no one has seen that you curse every time you think about it. Probably, yeah. I think <laughs> rules, you just have to have those, yeah. Yeah, maybe like an unhealthy addiction to coffee or tea too, but I mean, oh I'm just, now I'm just speaking for myself. <laughs> Um, okay, I think uh, Joanna has a, a hand up. Yeah, first I wanna say I didn't 
up now it no analysis on the party because i really like the tone of the narrator so it's nice to have a face to it and my question was on at least sisters and the waitress the ending's kind of like ominous i we, my group was wondering if you left that on purpose open for the reader or it was just how the story ended and you wanted to end it like that or is it for us to be able to make up our own story following it yeah thank you um i think when i was when i was an mfa student and particularly any time discussions of short stories happened or any time discussions of novels etc happened and professors said things like you know your character will tell you or your character will teach you what to do next or you will just have to follow the path laid down by your character and any time i heard that my reaction was always megan are we allowed to swear oh yes of course okay yeah. so every time i heard anything like oh the character will know i was always just like what the fuck does that mean <laughs> what does that mean i mean these are people you are creating in your own head i mean how does the author not know what the character is going to do next where is this magical the character will show you the way where does that come from so now i feel with a little bit now that i'm a little bit older hopefully a little bit wiser i think i understand what that means it just means not to rush the writing process and to spend time with the characters as they're coming to your head and i think that's true for poetry that's true for whether you're write, writing poetry or whether you're writing non fiction or plays or whatever to sit with what you're writing for a while and to let the characters breathe to let them behave and to sort of be quiet inside your head so you can listen to what is it that they want what is it that they're going to do next or want to do next So Joanna with the two stories you are you pointed out the characters stopped where the story stopped you know i mean that's pretty much the case with all the stories so um the same thing that would make me want to tear out my hair with the what the fuck do my do my professors mean it made sense in the writing of this book because <clears throat> like i said it was 14 years of you know spending time with a lot of them and giving them the time and space to to tell me who they are so that they don't all end up sounding like me because even the ones which are very loosely <clears throat> excuse me very loosely inspired by either my life or my family members they are not really me or they are not really my family members because they needed to be significantly different from me and so i just I just followed them as they went and I stopped where they stopped. So Joanna that's kind of that's the answer I can give you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks Joanna for that question. Um I know we're we're getting close to the end of the the evening here and I you know again I I appreciate you staying up so late with us uh tonight Sayanteni but I This do have been delightful so I can please do not uh think even for a second about you know time and stuff like that because it's been such a treat so anyway i'm sorry to interrupt you please go ahead oh no thank you um well i was wondering if you could maybe give us some recommendations for maybe other women writers who are maybe like misbehaving in the best of ways and we should check out their books ooh or anybody you know who you're reading now who you're super into uh oh this is this is such a good question because um i'm right now doing my good reads challenge so this year i think i've set mine for either 50 books or 55 books and i'm probably at like 35 or 38 right now so of course but now that you're asking me i cannot remember a single of the <laughs> that i've read or i'm claiming to have read but the book i always recommend and it's a very slim book it's it's not even by it's not by a female writer in fact so i will take your permission before i recommend it is that okay absolutely yes okay so this is the reluctant fundamentalist and i'm going to type down the title in the chat
And I'm sure one of you bright folks will be able to drop some link here which shows the book, etc. And it was turned into a movie which I have not watched. And I don't watch movie versions of most of the books that I really love. This book I have taught several times. It's written by a Pakistani writer, uh, Mohsin Hamid. And it's a slim, it's a, it's a novella. It's in first person. I have taught it several times. And every time I teach it, particularly in the US, I am afraid that Americans will not take to the book because there is some amount of anti-American sentiment in this book. And that's not the definitive element of this book. So that's not why I'm teaching it because I want to antagonize my American student. That's not the point of it. It's just a wonderfully written book that makes a lot of important points. And surprisingly, and this is to the credit of the students I've had, everyone loves this book. So this creates a lot of conversation. This creates, uh, this generates a lot of difficult conversation, a lot of good writing. So it's probably the one I would recommend to everyone, irrespective of whether they have anything to do with America or not. I just think it's storytelling at its finest. There we go. Well, thank you for the recommendation. And I guess I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I feel like my students will always ask me for recs or certain things. And it's like my mind goes blank. And then five seconds later, after they walk out of the class, I'm like, wait, I know now I can answer. <laughs> oh, why don't I email you a list tomorrow? That will be that will be the easiest thing for me to do, because uh, this is a book, like I said, um, I have taught uh, Mohsin Hamid's Reluctant Fundamentalist like a million times, and I love it. And I reread it almost once every year, but uh, there are bound to be at least 10 other books that I can recommend. And I'll be happy to send you an email and you can forward it to your, uh, to your wonderful class. I would love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's, it's a partially a selfish thing too, because I just love good book recs. And I've already gotten a few, I think, you know, from, from your Instagram page, so. <laughs> Um, all right, well, before I jump in here with my final question, I just wanted to open it up again to my students, our attendees. Do we have anything else that we, we wanted to, to ask? Uh, yes, Ardisha. Um, I wanted to ask, just because you've been talking about it a lot tonight, how do you, like, is it not intimidating that you, you, you write this beautiful collection of work and then you send it to your editors? It seemed like your editor has so much freedom with how they cultivated the book as a writer who, who's writing things that's loosely based on your life and it's a book that you've worked so hard with, how do you deal with like allowing your editors or publishers to have that much freedom with your work? I mean, thank you. That is a very kind question. Um, to an extent, you can't help it. That's the nature of publishing contracts that once you sign a contract, it's, it's the publishing houses, but uh, nearly all the good places, and this one was published by Penguin. So nearly all the good places, they will respect your integrity as a writer. So there were very few cosmetic changes within the stories and those that were suggested by the editors only made the story stronger. So that was fine. And the changes they made in terms of which story should come first, which story should come later, um, I think those were also good changes overall. Of course, in the moment when someone says that, oh, does this sentence really need to be this way or does it need to be something else? You are like, what? You are finding something problematic with my story? How dare you? I'm gonna gut you right now. But that's not, I think the fact that this was happening in India and I was here also helped my editors were physically safe from any trouble I might have given them had I been in person that what each of my sentences is not glowing like a nugget of gold. What is this allegation you're making? So in all, I think it was a wonderful thing that we had this distance. Um, and I think uh, Anisha, this is also important that you can just write the story you want to write. Beyond it, it's not in your hands whether people will like it one bit Will anyone will read it? Will anyone buy it? Will anyone even 
you know, um, keep it at their home or throw it. You cannot control any of these things. The only thing you can do is tell the stories as authentically as you can as they are coming to you. After that, it's up to the reader. If there will be any readers, you don't know that. Whether the book will be well received, you don't know that. Um, will there be any publicity or marketing? None of those things are in your hands. You can just write and then leave it all to fate, Instagram, whoever, you know, whatever, those forces are not in your hands. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, personally, I think all of your sentences were shining like little nuggets of gold. Thank you. So Thank I don't know you. what's up with those. Ideas. I would have been deeply offended if you had said even one sentence was lacking in its gold shining brilliance. <laughs> yes, not a one, not a one. The entire book just good. Yes, glowing. that's important. Yes, yes, glowing. All right. Um, well, so something that you said at the, at the beginning of the evening um, really resonated with me. And so I kind of wanted to circle back and I think that'll be a nice way to close out uh, today's or tonight's event that selfishness is a good thing. And I fully agree. And I'm wondering how might we be more selfish with our writing? Do you have any advice for us? Yes, absolutely. And actually I will not say how to be more selfish with writing per se, I will say how to be selfish with, with your time. So um, I have started drawing since uh, last October. I chanced upon this fun thing on Instagram. Um, gosh, this is like the second or third time I'm mentioning Instagram. I do not get anything by mentioning them. I should get something from mentioning them, but I'm not getting anything. So this delightful thing, called Inktober. Uh, I chanced upon it last year. And it's basically a drawing challenge. You draw something in response to the specific prompt for every day of the 31 days in October. So I started drawing, I drew in response to prompts on the, on the first day, second day. Then by the third or fourth day, I was like, you know, this is great. Let me just continue doing it. Today is what? Today is October 27th, 2021. So since October 1st, 2020, I have drawn every day of my life. I have drawn whether it's for five minutes, whether it's for two hours, whether it's just for a second in a grocery line, standing behind a stranger and drawing his backpack. I have drawn every single day. And there have been many days when I have not written. And if it had happened without, you know, before, write, before drawing started, if I missed days of writing, I would get really angry with myself. I would get very disappointed with myself. And those are just really weird, cruel things we do to ourselves, right? We are constantly punishing ourselves. And with drawing, Sometimes entire essays have come into my head when I'm drawing nothing connected with the essay. But just because drawing allows me to enter into a space of such quiet inside my head that it is amazing. And there is no one else there. I might be listening to an audiobook or I might be listening to some kind of a ridiculous podcast or watching a terrible movie playing in the background. Um, and by the 25th minute mark, there is this point I reach in my head, which is just so blissful and quiet. So that has helped so many areas of my life. I feel it has made me better organized. It has made me a better writer, I think. It has definitely made me a better reader. It has improved my marriage because I'm not yelling at my husband that often. Um, he's not in this room right now, but I bet he would testify with his hands on every holy book of the planet if I ask him, has drawing improved our marriage? Because it just puts me in a state of such calm for hours afterward, because I've had that time with just myself. That and getting rid of social media from my phone. Yes. These things have improved our marriage. I will go back. Can you hear, do you hear this? Yes. So 
people in San Diego, this is coming to you live from Wilmington. We are also offering marriage therapy or counseling, what, what, what have you. So uh, you did not know you signed up for relationship counseling when you signed up for this event tonight, but it's happening. Uh, so that drawing and getting rid of social media from my phone. Now I am only allowed uh, social media when I'm actually on my laptop because then I will access Facebook for whatever five minutes or you know um, Instagram or whatever else, Twitter. But I'm not allowed to download those on my phone. And the interesting thing is because all of these social media um, um, plat platforms, they have been designed to be so addictive on the phone that their app interface is so addictive. But the moment you use them on your laptop, they decrease their shine and brilliance and addiction by like 97%. You don't even feel like spending time on them. So it's just check and leave. And these two things, the drawing and the getting rid of social media, these two things working parallelly has been life-changing. I cannot recommend these things enough. And it might not be drawing for you. It might be gardening. It might be cooking. It might be uh, sewing a button. But the things you love doing as a kid I need you all to become super selfish and bring some of these things back in your life. You don't need to know what your aunt ate for breakfast this morning. You don't need to know that. You don't need to see vacation photos of your neighbor who you hate anyway. Uh, you don't need to know who had yet another baby. I mean, you were going to be happy for that person. Great, and you're gonna send a card. All that is wonderful. But you don't need to see minute by minute updates of anyone's life. You just need to pay attention to your life. So that's really what I mean by being selfish, being kind to ourselves, going back to the things we love doing as kids, because that's when we were our purest, our greatest selves. No toddler has ever thought after taking the first few steps and falling, oh, did I do this right? Should I be journaling about it? Should I see someone? Was my form right? No toddler things like that. They just get up and do it again and they fall up 500 times and it's amazing. So we need to go back to that state and find all the creative things we loved as kids, be that drawing or uh, making things or destroying things. And I think that is going to lead to amazing writing, reading, more time with the people you love, more time doing the things you love far more important than any money we can give to any of these social media giants. Well, I mean, that advice in and of itself was a the shiniest nugget of gold, I think we, we could have gotten this evening. So and everybody tuning in here, I mean, you, you receive not just an amazing reading and, and, and advice on writing, but like free therapy right now. So I, I am all for Yes, next time you come out here, Sayantani, bring your husband. We'll do like a side marriage counseling aspect to the uh, to the event. I'm all for that. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Let's thank Sayantani for her time this evening. Feel free to unmute and heal a real applause once again. Thank you. That was great. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yes, I'm switching this back to gallery view so we can see everybody. Um, and again, I mean, I cannot say thanks enough, Slantenny, for spending your evening with us. Um, and it's such a delight to see you again. And let's get you back out to San Diego for some delicious food as soon as we can. Yes, that would be just lovely food and all of these people in real life. Oh my gosh. And maybe I'll draw something. It can be ridiculous, but draw or, or <laughs> something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I absolutely encourage you all to take that advice and be selfish, you know, leave this session today and find something that you can be selfish about. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for all of your great questions. And uh, we hope to see you in a couple weeks back on Zoom for our next event. And again, Sayanteni, all the love from San Diego. And um, we so appreciate your time. Thank you again. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.